uh, slide on uh, your screen, yeah? Yes. OK, good. All right. So thank you so much for inviting me for this talk. And I know that Dr. Arif has asked me and uh, I thought that I should present with the acute abdomen. So um, um, what I've tried to done today is that, as you know, uh, basically acute abdomen is a very vast sort of a topic and it includes a lot of pathologies, um, including, uh, you know, traumatic injuries and all that. And it will not be possible to cover everything during this uh, talk. So. I haven't. Uh, I will not be showing you cases from uh, any trauma or subsequent uh, uh, bowel obstruction because we can do it later on. But what I try to do is today's talk is to give you a brief overview of what should be the radiological approach and to share with you some of the common uh, findings, uh, pathologies that we see on a daily basis. And then towards the end, we can take some questions as well. So I start off with the, the next slice, which is the acute abdomen. And I think probably you guys uh, know much better than myself. Um, what acute abdomen is. It's defined as a sudden onset of severe abdominal pain over a short period of time. And what is important is to have a structured approach to such patients. And uh, in the initial assessment, it is important to determine which uh, group of patients actually uh, belong to the acute uh, uh, surgical emergency, which would require a surgical intervention, or the group of patients who, who require an urgent medical therapy. Um, so the next slide is quite probably familiar to you, to yourself where uh, it shows the list of the life threatening sort of cases of acute abdomen and some of the cases which are self limiting um, um, and we all know about these cases. I try tend to when I look from radiological perspective into the uh, sort of these patients, I think of the the causes which require much more urgent intervention. And those can be the ones which present with some sort of a bleeding in the abdomen. Either it is a leaking AAA or, you know, a perforated DU or ruptured ectopic pregnancy or even trauma because some of these patients might present with hypovolemic shock. And if they're not treated or diagnosed in a timely fashion, they can end up with basically, uh, you know, I mean, uh, they can die as well. So that's an important group. Uh, the second group is the one which who presents with the perforation of a viscous and we can we're going to go through with the causes of that or the third one which is the ischemic bowel so uh, a practical approach uh, to the such patients uh, is a very important one as the relevant clinical information and for this we rely heavily on uh, the clinical colleagues and the ed physicians and uh, how it helps us is actually it helps us to as radiologists to narrow down the differential diagnosis uh, of such cases and also helps us to choose the right imaging modality because uh, uh, time is very important in such patients and you don't tend to lose by actually ordering the wrong test or repeating the imaging um, so um, uh, so these two things are very important uh, and you know from your perspective obviously you you have uh, you know array of lab tests that you do you can do clinical examination but we know that they can be sometimes very non specific uh, you know relying uh, on 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 the clinical findings and sometimes we may not even get the answers you know i mean after doing all that bit in imaging and some you know a very few patients can end up with having an exploratory laparotomy so what I sort of tend to suggest is that that it's very important that many disorders can present uh, with acute abdomen, but unfortunately only a few of these are very common and clinically important. And if we tend to focus uh, during the triage on these patients, i.e. both examination wise and uh, you know, putting the investigation, then we can fo focus on confirming or excluding those frequent disorders, and that might actually help us in getting the right diagnosis. So coming back to the imaging algorithm, sorry about the slide. Um, so uh, we have uh, a series of batteries of uh, imaging tests that is available to us. Uh, the top one is the plain films. And as we know, uh, plain films are sort of used in the detection of, uh, you know, in instances for renal colic, kidney stone detection or for pneumoperitoneum. They have got a minor role to play. Uh, in, in imaging of these patients and some some of the uh, imaging which is done via, via plain films can actually be very non-specific and normal films cannot actually exclude uh, uh, a pathology and I will share uh, you know this uh, uh, in the next slide. Um, the next imaging modality is the ultrasound 
and that is uh, basically a non-radiation uh, one. We know it is very good modality to be used in children and young patients. Uh, it comes with its own limitation if the patient uh, has got uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, a large body habitus or obese patient, ultrasound is not good because the penetration of the beam is not very good. So you struggle to see the structures. Uh, if the structures are located in abnormal locations, uh, such as the appendix, etc., you may not be able to see them very clearly. If the abdomen is very gassy, uh, or you have got, let's say, for instance, air in the lumen of appendix and you're looking to exclude appendicitis, you still struggle with that. And we know that there are cases of tip appendicitis where there is just localized inflammatory changes in the tip of the appendix. And sometimes they may have been missed because you have seen the proximal end of the appendix, which looks normal. And for, for some reason, you haven't scanned the whole of the appendix. So those are the things to keep in mind, uh, you know, when probably choosing the imaging modality. I'm not going to talk about the FAST scan because you already know that, you know, I mean, that's the focus assessment uh, uh, with sonography and trauma, and you 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 guys are already aware of that. Um, uh, moving on to CT, if the ultrasound is inconclusive for whatever reason, some of the reasons I've mentioned you earlier on, then you move on to CT. We have the option of doing CT without contrast in patients with renal impairment, depending on the clinical indication, or we can do CT with contrast. And uh, MRI is all uh, is also there. Uh, this has been probably there for the last, uh, I would say, decade or so, still in the evolving phase, and is very helpful in be for being used in uh, children, uh, pediatric population, and in pregnant patients. And uh, I'm going to sort of further elab elaborate about uh, the MRI uh, later during the talk. Uh, the only thing I would say about MR is that, that uh, uh, you know, if you intend to request for these uh, uh, sort of uh, the issues is obviously with finding a slot and also uh, patients with acute abdomen may be uh, sort of uh, require a little bit more time as opposed to CT because you can do a quick scan on CT versus an MR. If the patient is heavily breathing or is tachycardic, then the imaging is not going to be very good. So those are the limitations that you have to think. Also very important is that in pregnant patients during the first trimester, you cannot give IV contrast. So if you are uh, authorizing any scan which requires a gadolinium, then that's contraindicated during the first trimester. So those are the things that you need to keep into mind. Obviously, pacemakers and all the other contraindications of MR are still going to be there. So uh, coming back to acute ab abdomen, location approach is the one which uh, all of uh, us tend to think, and we tend to divide the abdomen into quadrants, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, and we intend to sort of look into the pathologies based on that. That gives us a roadmap of actually in our list of differential diagnosis, what we are thinking and whether this could be this pathology or uh, some other pathology. Uh, this uh, uh, on the on your screen, you will see uh, an X-ray of the abdomen on the left hand side, followed by a CT on the right hand side. And this is just to emphasize how X-rays can be non-specific. On the X-ray, you can see that you know you have got a bit of uh, gas uh, in the stomach. You've got some non-specific small bowel loops, or maybe you know some air in the right side of the colon. But it looks fairly kind of normal, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the X-ray. But then when you do the CT and you can see the arrowheads pointing, you can see the fluid filled dilated small bowel loops. And therefore, this patient had small bowel obstruction. And if you would have looked at the X-ray, you'd have just passed it at normal. Whereas by doing CT, you could see that patient has features of small bowel obstruction. And the reason why it was not picked up on the X-ray was that because these bowel loops were fluid filled, therefore, uh, you know, they were not picked up. Had these loops contained more sort of air or gas in it, then you may be able to see them by virtue of having multiple fluid levels. So that's that's where the plain films actually don't give you much sort of information. So um, the erect chest film is the standard film. Uh, you know, if you want to do it in the scenario of acute abdomen, we are suspecting perforation. And we know that, you know, the areas to look for is under the diaphragm where you can see free gas. Uh, you have to remember that patients who are lying down, you need to give them time of at least 10 minutes for the air to rise to the highest point, which is under the diaphragm. And with regards to uh, how much of free gas you can detect, uh, well, in the literature, you know, they talk about as little as one ml 
of uh, free gas can be detected. But then there are lots of variable. And obviously we know that CT is far more superior in detecting uh, tiny blobs of air in the tummy as opposed to uh, erect chest film. The other films that you tend to do in such patients is a supine abdominal film. So I try to make it a little bit more interactive by just throwing this film and uh, see what the audiences think about. Do you think this is a normal abdominal radiograph or do you think it is abnormal? And if it is abnormal, what is the abnormality here? So anyone can just shout uh, before uh, I sort of uh, tend to give you the diagnosis. So just need a volunteer. It's an abnormal X-ray with dilated bowel, possibly um, baldness or obstruction. Okay. okay, so so that's good. So which which part of the bowel do you think? Is it a small bowel or a large bowel? Um, it looks like um, looks like a small bowel. Good. And why do you say it is a small bowel and not large bowel? Because there's no frustration in it. Yeah, good. That's good. So one of the ways to differentiate is the location of the bowel, whether they are peripherally placed or centrally placed. Centrally placed loops are more likely to be small bowel. And also to look for valvuli conuventis, which are like continuous uh, uh, strip of folds that you can see. In, and, and obviously, you know where the hostel pattern in the large bowel is going to be more peripheral. So one thing is that, yes, you see the dilated abnormal bowel loops. Any other finding on this X-ray? Any other observation? Can you see a free gas in there? You can identify both sides of the bowel wall, so you'd be suspicious that there was free gas in the abdomen. And so what do you call that? So that's known as in radiology, we call that regular sign. So that's very good. So obviously, uh, if you look at this X-ray, you get, go, you can see the dilated uh, bowel loops there. But on the background, you see also air, which is not conforming to the shape of the bowel, right? So it's everywhere. So it's a large pneumoperitoneum. And one of the other signs that you could see here is you could identify the inner as well as the outer wall of the bowel. And that's known as the regular sign. So excellent. So that signs tell you, basically gives you an idea that there is a large amount of pneumoperitoneum. So this is the CT image, and obviously you can see fairly large amount of free air, which is just sitting anterior to the liver and to the bowel loops. So here, these are contrast filled small bowel loops. And uh, uh, remember that with regards to pneumoperitoneum, it doesn't follow the contours of the bowel loops. So the air or the gas tends to fill up the empty spaces. And they here you can see that's just filling up the uh, you know space, the perihepatic space. And this structure with the arrowhead is, is actually the falciform ligament. So it's outlining both sides of the falciform ligament. So those are the things that you need to see on CT, uh, uh, you know, to consider the diagnosis of free gas or pneumoperitoneum. Obviously, you can also see free gas in post-surgical patients. So again, the history is more important, uh, basically, uh, in such scenarios. So now, um, this X-ray, the next one, it just says that it's a lateral decubitus film, and I don't know uh, whether any of you have had any experiences in looking at these X-rays. They used to be done in the uh, pre-CT era, I would say, when CT scans were not available. And these x-rays were taken and patients who were very unwell, sick, who cannot sit up or are able to stand up. And what they normally tend to do is to uh, make them uh, lie down uh, right side up and left side down. And if they have a suspected uh, uh, perforation, the air will tend to rise to the highest point between the body wall and the edge of liver. And this is what we used to call the cross table view. So this is a lateral decubitus film. This can be added on to the series uh, uh, of the, uh, the X-rays that we take. So the erect film, the supine and the lateral decubitus. But these, the, this is not being used currently because we have CT scan, which is much more sensitive. So uh, this next one, again, just to show you uh, we are talking about pneumoperitoneum, free air, and uh, can someone, I've got an x-ray of the abdomen on your left-hand side and a corresponding coronal CT image on the right-hand side. And uh, can anyone, again, I need a volunteer here, 
could identify what the abnormality is on this uh, X-ray. Gas within the bowel wall. That's very That's good. Very Excellent. Good. So this is what we call pneumatosis interstitialis. So here you can see this crescent of air, which is uh, basically along where the bowel wall should be. There's some more uh, along lower down here. There are some dilated small bowel loops. And this is a CT, which tells you that these are the dilated small bowel loops. And you can see the air, which is within the wall of the bowel. And uh, uh, you know, I mean, you can find a whole list of uh, cases of pneumatosis. Some of them are benign, self-limiting. Others are more kind of acute uh, uh, sort of emergencies. And the two important ones to remember is either uh, uh, ischemic or infarcted gangrenous bowel because of a transmural infarction uh, or in pediatric age group to consider necrotizing enterocolitis. So those are two main things that you need to remember if you see them. And obviously, once you get uh, you know, intramural gas, you then have to look for portal venous gas, uh, which is which you can recognize on plain x-rays or also on the CT scan. So this is another pattern where you can find uh, air, uh, abnormal uh, collection of air. So one is within the peritoneal cavity. The other one is within the uh, bowel wall, which is the pneumatosis. So that's very good. Moving on to this one, next x-ray. So uh, again, uh, you know, what do you think? Where do you think the abnormality is? So when you look, yeah, go on. Looks like small bowel. Uh, okay, that's good. So there is actually, there is a generalized degree of bowel dilatation. <laughs> So you can see some of the small bowel loops here, but then you can argue maybe the ones loops which are located maybe periphery on the periphery could be in the large bowel. But there is there is some degree of generalized gases distension of the bowel loops, dilated loops. OK, that's a good observation. Anything else happening here? So when you're looking at the X-rays, particularly the abdominal films, there are a couple of things that you need to see. So you need to identify which part of the bowel it is, whether it's small or large. What's the location of the bowel? What is the caliber of the bowel? And then you need to look for whether any features to suggest intestinal obstruction, any free gas, any calcifications, and then you move on to the periphery of the film where you can look into the soft tissues and finally the bones. So that gives you basically, you know, uh, sort of how to interpret the, uh, the abdominal film. So on this X-ray, as you've said, bowel loops look abnormal, dilated, is there any other thing that you could see? Surgical emphysema on the right side. OK, so that's good. So you could see some linear collection of gas on the right side. And where do you think this air is? Is it intraperitoneal? Is it extraperitoneal? Or, it's, or is it in the bowel wall? I think it's extraperitoneal. So it's extraperitoneal, right. And why do you say that? Is it in the soft tissue of the abdominal wall? Yeah, so so that's good. So basically, it doesn't look like intraperitoneal because you should see either uh, large blobs of gas or you should be able to see the regular sign. It looks in the soft tissues. It could be uh, extraperitoneal, which is good. And so that's a CT. And uh, here the CT is done with contrast. So you can see just to identify the structures. That's a kidney with some small cysts. That's your aorta. And here, you can see the right kidney. And you can see that this should be the normal kidney with the retroperitoneal fat around it, which is this kind of black to gray structure here. And that's all been replaced by gas around the kidney, and then it's extending into the paracolic gutter. So, uh, Dr. Khan, are you using the pointer? Because I can't see the pointer. Uh, I, your mouse. Uh, OK. Um, are you I'm, using the mouse? Or? I am using the mouse. I but can't see it. You can't see it. Yeah. Is it the, in the in the room as well? They can't see it, or anybody shout from the room? We cannot see the pointer. pointer. Oh, you can't see the pointer. Um, I don't know what else can I sort of do because I have got the cursor here, which is which uh, I can hover on the on top of the presentation. Are, so, are you on the slide show uh, more? 
I am in the slideshow. Yes. If, if you just go out of slide more, then uh, uh, try it. It might we might be able to see the cursor then. Uh, so, hang on. I'll try and see what happens. Um. Can you? Um, we're just going back to the. Sorry, I just went into the. So. Yeah, you can't still see the cursor. No, no I can't see. Doctor Khan, we are still fine with the pathology. I can point out to anyone else who can't understand what you're trying to say. So. Okay. okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, uh, uh, RF as well. But uh, I, I really don't know. I mean, uh, what else I can do from my end? Uh, have you tried coming out of slide mode? Uh, show show mode. So yeah. So here I am on the. So it's just showing that I'm on the presenter mode. And uh, just the, if you come out of slide show mode, then sometimes you know it works the things. And where where would it say that I am actually because on my view, I've got the grid view and then I've got more actions which is say view slide in a higher contrast translate slides. I can't see anything. Uh, hang on laser pointer. Let's try with this one. Let's see if it does anything. Can you see the pointer now? Yes, can you see it now? I very clearly. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Very clearly. OK, okay. that's great. Sam. That's great. So that should answer the question. So I'm going to use this one now just to demonstrate it. So this is what I meant that, you know, you've got the left kidney and then you've got the fat, which is a retroperitoneal fat around it. Whereas on the right hand side, this is all uh, along the right kidney. This has all been replaced by this black area, which is the retroperitoneal air. OK, and then you can see this extending into the root of the small bowel mesentery as well. This is the pancreas there, and then you see further free air more anteriorly. So the idea of showing this one and the on the previous slide, uh, which is this one here, is to demonstrate to you the extraperitoneal uh, or the retroperitoneal air, which is the third column where the air can actually sit in because of various pathology. In this patient, patient had uh, ERCP, and he had a perforation of the duodenum, and that actually led to the retro uh, pneumo retroperitoneum. So that's the third compartment where you can actually get the air. And so this is important to recognize these pathologies on plain X-rays if you are intending to do them in ED or otherwise CT can actually show you them. So now we move on to uh, following our discussion. I just wanted to share some of the basics in the uh, sort of uh, the imaging uh, of the plain X-rays. We were not going to follow the quadrant uh, sort of a, uh, um, um, method where we are going to just discuss some of the commonly seen pathologies in the right upper and lower quadrant. So this patient presented with right upper quadrant pain and there was a clinical suspicion of uh, cholecystitis. And what you can see in the lower bottom X uh, sort of ultrasound image here is you can see the gallbladder a gallbladder is thick walled here, and you can see multiple stones, which are like pinhead size uh, echogenic uh, foci. You see some distal uh, shadowing, which is typical uh, with stones or any calcified object. Uh, and so this is a classic appearance of uh, calcular cholecystitis. Um, uh, and this should be enough to give you a diagnosis. Sometimes we do do CT to look for complications. And that's the CT again. You know, I mean, you may not be able to see the stones if they're not very calcified ones, but the features you see is basically a thick wall enhancing gallbladder. You see pericholecystic fluid and stranding around it, and that's the basically uh, presentation of cholecystitis on the CT. Um, the other conditions which can present with the right upper quadrant pain, uh, i.e., the biliary colic. And uh, uh, again, I would just go back to this slide. And uh, although uh, we may be able to see uh, common bile duct stones, but the uh, 
visualization of the distal CBD, which is in the head of the pancreas, can sometimes be obscured by bowel gases. And imagine that these patients who haven't actually been not been eating, uh, they tend to have more air in the stomach and the rest of the small bowel. So sometimes we we can easily miss uh, sort of stones in the distal CBD. And therefore, the modality of choice is either you do a CT, and again, it will depend how dense uh, or how much of calcium is within the stones to make them visible on CT. But MRCP is basically the, the standard. So these are coronal MIP images. They are heavily T2 weighted images, which means that they will brighten wherever the fluid is and suppress the rest of the organs and soft tissue. So you can see a distended gallbladder. There's a filling defect in the uh, fundus of gallbladder, which is a stone. The intrahepatic bile ducts are dilated. This is a CBD, which is dilated, and you can see two uh, uh, low signal intensity filling defects with, compatible with stones in the common bile duct. And here on the axial images, you can see the filling defect within the common bile duct, and that confirms basically the presence of stone in the, in the CBD. So biliary colic is again, you know, where you can't actually give an answer with uh, uh, ultrasound and you suspect uh, basically a stone in the CBD raised uh, uh, bilirubin levels and all that, you can consider MRCP and it gives us quite good actually sort of uh, information and uh, diagnosis from that perspective. Pyronephritis is again one of the other conditions that patient can present with right or left upper quadrant pain. And often, as you know, in young patients, you know, we tend to ask for ultrasound and uh, it should be the first modality and what you expect to see in these patients, apart from clinical examination, your positive renal punch and, you know, uh, lab uh, uh, test. Uh, this is a scan, longitudinal scan of the kidney. And here it shows an area of uh, uh, echogenic, which means that it is much more brighter than the rest of the cortex. The cortex is normally, uh, renal cortex is of uh, what we call hypochoic or rather black in texture. And the medulla is more echogenic, but if you look at this here, the, you can see a fair sort of a discrete area of abnormal echogenicity near the upper pole. And when we put the Doppler signals here, you see there is vascularity in the rest of the kidney, but rather the upper pole, which looks slightly bulkier, is avascular. And that's the typical spectrum of finding in patients with pyelonephritis. And the question is, do you Ten, do you need to do CT uh, on them? No, if, if the diagnosis is confirmed with ultrasound and, and the clinical parameters are actually matching, you don't need to do CT in those patients. Um, and this next slide again, uh, I would like to sort of uh, uh, need the audience opinion on here. So this is a patient who presented with right uh, upper quadrant pain and uh, some uh, sort of uh, dipstick hematuria. And so ended up with having a CT. And do you see any abnormality there? Yeah. Right kidney hypo uh, dense area. That's good. So here in the right kidney, you can see a uh, sort of a large sort of round uh, hypo uh, uh, dense or low density area. And uh, if you look uh, at the uh, uh, perinephric fascia there that's thickened. There's a bit of faint stranding in the perinephric fat as well. And those are the things that go along with pyelonephritis. So, you know, I mean, with the pyelonephritis, it could be focal, it could be diffuse, and the imaging appearances would vary upon the presentation. And with the focal pyelonephritis, you tend to see an area within the renal parenchyma which doesn't show vascularity, which which corresponds to what I've shown on ultrasound on the Doppler signals. So the vascularity is less because that's more sort of infected in edematous area and you see the changes extending into the perinephric fat. So now what I need to know from the audience is actually, I've got two more cases at the bottom and there is obviously some abnormality in the right kidney and here there's abnormality in the left kidney. So uh, I just need sort of opinion. What do you think about these two cases? Do you think this is pyelonephritis? Or do you think there's just some other abnormality or pathology going on? Sorry? Sorry. 
Okay, so the image on the left hand side, excellent. You said wedge infarct, right? Okay, so again, and what about the one on the right side? So right bottom. Atrophic Sorry, can you just speak a bit loud? Um, atrophic kidney. Okay, okay, that's fine. So I'll come back to it. So we, ha we have agreed on this one. This is pyelonephritis. This was excellent. So you said wedge infarct, yes, because it's typically wedge shape, and that's how we differentiate the infarcts from pyelonephritis. So both of them processes can appear low density, but uh, with pyelonephritis, it's more globular, ill-defined margins, but with the infarcts, it's more typical classic wedge shape. Coming back to this case, uh, you said at atrophic kidney, and I can understand why you said, but if you look at the kidney, you can actually see the rest of the kidney there. It's just the whole kidney is actually very low density. And where the pointer is, that's only the enhancing cortical rim. The rest of this is all replaced by this process which is going on in the kidney. And so uh, the question here is that, is this pyelonephritis or is this some other pathology? And the answer to that question is basically based on the arrowhead, which is on the cortical rim. So this is a case of basically uh, 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 a renal infarct. And uh, the only spayed area is this cortical rim because it gets supply from the overlying capsular and subcapsular arteries, not by the renal artery. So, so this is something to look for if you are suspecting a renal infarct because uh, if this was infection, it should have actually been completely low signal uh, or low density of the kidney. So this gives you an idea that this is not an infection. This is actually a renal infarct. And obviously, if you do your clinical parameters, then you will not find you know, the other indicators of raised inflammatory markers and all that. So this is just to show you how pyelonephritis and renal infarct will look on CT and what to look for infarct and what to look for pyelonephritis. And again, that would be the presentation of right or upper or left upper quadrant pain. So coming back to the other entity, which is a right lower quadrant pain, we have got a group of cases that, you know, are pathologies that involve the right lower quadrant. So first of all, I'll show you this scan. This is a scan of the right lower quadrant ultrasound scan, and it shows you on the right hand side a tubular structure, which looks like collapsed structure, blind tubular structure. And on the right hand side, you can see the axial uh, image where it has got a targetoid appearance. And this is actually a normal looking appendix. And you can see that if, I don't know whether you could see the uh, calipers there to mark the uh, sort of outer and the outer wall and with a measurement of 3.2 millimeter. So this is a normal looking appendix. OK, and uh, move on to the next one on the CT image. So you have some enteric contrast, which is appearing bright here in the colon, which is the cecum and the small bowel loops. And here in the right ilac fossa, you can see a small a structure which has got a central speck of air in it. And that's a normal looking appendix with some air or gas in it. So when you have patients with appendicitis, right, the signs of appendicitis, obviously there's a clinical signs. And then imaging wise, the outer to outer diameter of the appendix should be more than six millimeter. There should be inflamed periappendiceal fat around it. You can see uh, appendical lith. And when you put Doppler, you see increased vascularity on power Doppler because it's an inflammatory process. So if we go back to the next slide. Again, remember the one I shown you, the first one. Here you see the tubular structure, but this time it's distended and it appears thick walled. And again, the targetoid appearance, but the lumen is distended, filled with fluid. And if you measure from outer to outer. In this case, it's going to be more than six millimeter. And on this slide here, you can see that there is quite a bit of vascularity. This is the Doppler. So if you see a blind structure in the right alec fossa, which appears distended, the diameter is more than six millimeter. It shows vascularity on Doppler. The likelihood diagnosis is acute appendicitis. Same process on CT. Again, contrast CT, and you can see this is the ascending colon, and posterior to it, you can see this structure which has got a little bit of mural enhancement, thickening, 
lumen is distended, a lot of stranding, which is extending into the paracolic fat. And here more medially, you can see small volume lymph nodes. These are reactive lymph nodes, and this is again acute appendicitis. OK, so another case, and here you can see that you can see the similar findings of this tubular structure there, a lot of stranding, and you can see now some air in the lumen of the appendix as well as this echogenic structure here, which is an appendicolith, and you can see the appendicolith sitting there. So these are the various appearances of appendicitis on ultrasound and on CT. Now, the ultrasound, when you do for these uh, pathologies, we all know that by virtue of their anatomy, the appendix doesn't have a fixed location. So, you know, you can try to find the appendix in its normal position, but sometimes you may end up with having a very high riding subhepatic appendix or the appendix which is actually crossing the midline or patients have got non-rotation of the gut. You know, you've got uh, the cecum and large ball on the left hand side where the appendix will be in the left iliac fossa or the appendix can move down you know, leading if there's a hernia, which I will show you in the next case, can go down into the groin area. So there's a there is a fair bit of degree of variability in the uh, sort of uh, location of the appendix. And again, if you are doing an ultrasound, it is basically if you can't find the appendix in its normal position, right, uh, you would struggle because you you are going to miss the diagnosis because you haven't tried to look for the appendix in the location it is actually abnormally placed. So coming back to this one, this patient actually ended up with having an appendix which is sitting right under the right lobe of diaphragm, which we call the subhepatic location of the appendix, very high up. And that's the, uh, you can see the dilated uh, sort of thick wall appendix there and with all the features of appendicitis. So again, you know, I mean, think about the abnormal location and therefore the right upper quadrant pain can be due to cholecystitis, but you know, if it is a high riding appendix can also present in a similar fashion. This is again an abnormal location. So here the cecum is in the midline. The cecum should be normally in the right iliac fossa, which should be here, but you can see the cecum is lying in the midline and that's the inflamed appendix. So again, if if I was scanning here, I would be targeting the right iliac fossa, and if I don't see the appendix, I would say appendix not visualized. Whereas again, uh, based on the, your clinical information, you would probably say that there's more tenderness located in the midline or to the off the midline, and then that would help actually the sonographer or the radiologist to look for in that area, uh, you know, uh, trying to look for appendix or any other pathology. So this is an entity which has been described in the uh, literature, and uh, this basically is a kind of a hernia, which is the hernia in the groin, which actually, as it drags down the abdominal contents, it takes the appendix with it. And if uh, this hernia gets obstructed, uh, the appendix is usually lying down in the groin. So it's not no more in the right iliac fossa. It actually goes down into the groin, and it gets strangulated, and you can have all the features of appendicitis, you know, on CT and ultrasound. So those are the variations that to consider and to look for. So how about the post-surgical patients? So you've had patients who have had uh, kind of, uh, you know, in ED come across that patients are coming with right iliac fossa pain, and you talk to the patient and they say, oh, I've had appendicectomy done years and years back. And then, you know, you probably left with to think about other differential diagnosis is what's going on. So this is a post-surgical patient. Uh, I haven't given you the diagnosis, and I just want, again, the audiences to be a little bit more interactive, and if somebody could tell me what, do you, what are their thoughts about this case. So this is a CT scan coronal image. That's a CT axial image, and this is a CT sagittal image, and these are demonstrating the cecal pole. So that's the pole of the cecum, and I just need a volunteer just quickly just to tell me what's going on here. There's a fecolid. OK, okay good. good. So yeah, there is a fecolid there. And where do you think this fecolid is? Is that the site of um, previous appendectomy? Uh, yeah, good, very good. So this is what we call stump appendicitis. So
So this patient has got an appendicular there. There's still a short stump there, and you can see a lot of inflammatory changes. If you look here, there's a lot of, so normal fat, this is the normal fat, okay? This is the normal fat in the right iliac fossa. And look around this appendicle lit, the fat is dirty. There's a lot of stranding going on there. Again, here, there's a thickening of the sequel pole. And again, here, you see the thickening of the sequel pole reactive changes. So this is stump appendicitis. And this is, again, to show you what the things that patients who have had surgery can still come back and they can still have appendicitis in the residual stump. So something to think uh, about. Okay. So quickly, I will go through with this one. Again, a patient post sort of uh, surgical uh, who had a perforated appendix, and then they took the appendix out and later on presented with abscess. So you can see a large collection there, which is uh, basically a sort of in the pelvis, and that is on the CT. Uh, on the ultrasound, you can see the transvaginal ultrasound images, and you can see the abscess with some internal echoes there. And again, the abscess of collection. So these patients who have had surgery, you know, can have stump appendicitis or they can come back, you know, with the residual collection and they can also present uh, with acute sort of, of uh, lower abdominal pain. And this is again, again, the same sequela of uh, following up the appendix, you know, patient who had some surgery for perforated appendix and then had an ultrasound scan which showed distended small bowel loops. And this patient had subacute small bowel obstruction because of adhesions. And this slide on this side actually demonstrates that this patient has got a port hernia. So they did the sort of uh, appendicectomy via the laparoscopically, and then they had a, a port side hernia, which patient came back later on, uh, which the hernia was obstructed. So they had to go back and repair this hernia. So these are the potential sort of uh, complications and things uh, which can happen after appendicectomy to look for intestinal obstruction, adhesions, port site hernia, and the stem appendicitis. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some of the mimics of patients who are coming up, uh, you know, with right lower quadrant pain. We've looked at appendicitis, and again, I'll try to make it a little bit more interactive by asking the audience, what do you think about? So this patient is again in a pediatric age group, and has got a right lower quadrant pain, and this is an image from ultrasound. What do you think about this? Yeah, just the bowel and loops, which is dilated. Um, Thank um, you. Uh, I mean, you won't have air, sorry, fluid filled, sorry. That's okay. what you get in ultrasound. Do, do, do you think, does it look like a bowel loop? I know it's very, it's, it's sometimes difficult actually to sort of comment on this one, but does this look like a bowel loop? If you look at it, these are like discrete hypochoic areas. I mean, with the bowel loops, you need to have a little bit of continuity. Would you agree to that? They look like, there are like nodules, one there, another one there, third one there, fourth one there. So if I have to tell you, that, yeah, that's good, yes. So these are actually enlarged lymph nodes, okay? So uh, remember that the bowel loop, let me show you the previous slide so you have a little bit of understanding. If you look at this image, the bowel loop will have a continuation, okay? Look at this one. It's a continuous loop. It's a continuous loop on the longitudinal scan. Whereas if you scan them on a transverse, it might look like something that you have seen. But here, if you go back, these are small uh, kind of volume lymph nodes. So mesenteric adenitis is one of the conditions which affect children and kind of more teenager group. And it's basically, uh, you know, post-viral or it could be other causes. There's a lot of inflammation in the lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes, uh, the, the criteria, the sonographic criteria for adenitis is that you should see at least cluster of three or more lymph nodes. And the short axis diameter, which is that you measure from here to here, this is the short axis diameter of the lymph node. So what we say is that this one is a long axis, but the short axis is this one. So the short axis diameter of the lymph node, it should basically 
sort of be more than six millimeter. And so one thing is the cluster of lymph nodes. The second thing is that you should have short excess diameter of those lymph nodes more than six millimeter. And the third thing is that you should see a normal appendix. And why is it important to see a normal appendix? I'll come back to the slide. Because the reason for that is that, that if you have seen a normal appendix, you have excluded the diagnosis of acute appendicitis, right? Because sometimes if the patient has appendicitis, you can still get reactive lymph nodes. So you don't want to miss an appendicitis in the background setting by looking just at the lymph nodes and then just labeling them as this is mesenteric adenitis. So if you see the appendix, it gives you confidence of the diagnosis, and then you can safely exclude acute appendicitis. And this is actually a CT which shows you the cluster of lymph nodes, which are there in the right paracolic gutter. And, and sometimes there might be some thickening in the ileocecal region as well, which can be seen with patients with mesenteric adenitis. So mesenteric adenitis, as we know, can present also with right low quadrant pain and should be one of the differential, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in that pediatric or teenage group with appendicitis. Okay, so what about this one now? So again, this is a CT scan. And again, you see that in front of the cecum. So this is the cecum because, you know, there, 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 you know the, if you look at the configuration of the bowel, it's different than this one or this one. These are small bowel loops. This is definitely colon, the left side, and this is the right side. So the anterior to the cecum and the fat, you see this uh, kind of ring-shaped structure there, and the fat around it is very dirty, okay? So if I tell you this is not appendicitis, right? What else it could be? Can this be diverticulitis? No idea. Okay. okay. Right. So, so to answer this question, you can you can see diverticulitis. Diverticulitis is more commonly seen on the left side, but it can be right-sided diverticulitis, and you have to see an inflamed diverticulum, right, to give it a diagnosis of a right-sided diverticulitis, right? So this is not diverticulitis. This is not appendix. And what it is is that it is an inflammatory condition which affects the fat-filled pouches on the colon, which we call the epiploic appendagitis. So it is an inflammation of those fat-filled pouches which are attached to the large bowel, and what we call them as uh, epiploic appendagitis. So this should also be considered in the differential diagnosis of right lower quadrant pain. So if you have seen the appendix, it's not appendicitis. If you have excluded diverticulitis, then this is the appearances of epiploic appendagitis, uh, which should be considered in the differential diagnosis. Okay, so another one. Now here, Again, a CT scan, axial view through the pelvis. You can see the small bowel loops in the right iliac fossa. You see something. And uh, this is the left side of the colon. So this is an abnormality which is involving the large bowel, okay? Or I, I must say the cecum. So here you see basically the soft tissue thickening, which is kind of filling up the lumen of the cecum, okay? Now, if I have to tell you that there is, this is not the appendix, and it doesn't look like appendicitis that I've shown you earlier on. It's not diverticulitis. It's not the uh, epiploic appendagitis. What other condition can you think of the bowel, which involves the, which can involve basically the large bowel or the cecum or any part of the large bowel where you have got basically considerable thickening of the bowel wall? So cecal tumor, very good. Yes. So excellent. This this is this was a cecal tumor, and sometimes the cecal tumors can present with acute abdomen and with lower quadrant pain because either they are causing colonic obstruction, so patient can present, or if they have perforated, they can present, or if they are lower down and obstructing the uh, uh, lumen of appendix, and and they can cause as presentation could be acute appendicitis. And often it's seen that, you know, the surgeons will go in and they will resect it. And then on histology, you will find a small carcinoid, which was just sitting at the orifice of appendix. So again, I would say that, you know, 
I mean, those are the differentials that you could see. And I'm just showing you the various appearances of the pathologies that can actually sort of uh, you can see in, in, in your daily practices uh, when you're requesting the scans. And I'm sure you'll be going through with the reports. So this was a sequel tumor. OK, so this entity that I'm going to show you here is just, as I said, uh, going to be one of the mimics. So this patient was suspected to have, uh, you know, uh, abdominal pain. Uh, eventually started off with an ultrasound and ultrasound picked up some thickening in the appendix. This is a tubular structure, showed some thickening in the appendix. And it was presumed that this could be an appendicitis. Subsequently had CT scan done and CT actually showed more abnormality rather than. Uh, so what it showed was that this mesentery, which is showing haziness and some inflammatory changes in the mesentery. If you see here, this is the pancreas. The head of the pancreas is bulky. There is some fluid in the root of the small bowel mesentery. And so this patient had pancreatitis and there was some fluid uh, which has gone down into the right alec fossa. And it it was mimicking as if this patient has got appendicitis, but it was actually a pancreatitis. So again, you know, I mean, uh, probably uh, one of the things to be aware of because, you know, different pathologies can actually sort of present in a different way and can involve other structures as well. So this other condition, again, something to do with and uh, can present with the right sided pain. And I will just show you this is an ultrasound image and where the arrowheads are. It's just showing that the fat, which is the mental fat, appears a bit hypochoic, which is of low uh, sort of uh, texture here. If you look on the CT, this is the ascending colon and the fat behind the ascending colon is clear black. Whereas if you look at the fat anterior to the right side of the colon, it's very dirty as if there is a bit of stranding in there. OK, and likewise, here is another case where where the arrowhead is. You can see the fat in the sort of mesentery, which is appearing black. But here the mental fat is like a very misty appearance of this mental fat. So this is a localized process uh, and it's an omental infarct uh, and uh, omental infarcts again, you know, uh, again, a self-limiting sort of a condition. Uh, but the important thing here is that that these patients can present with lower abdominal pain. You need to exclude appendicitis and you don't want uh, these patients to go for unnecessary laparotomies and to take a normal appendix out. So this will also come omental infarct will also come in the differential diagnosis of low cotton pain. And that's how they present. Just a little bit of dirtiness of the mesentery fat. No other abnormality in the scan that can be seen. So moving on, uh, this case, again, right iliac fossa around the cecum. You can see thickening of the bowel, lot of fat stranding, dirty appearance of the uh, sort of uh, paracolic gutter. Within the paracolic gutter, this patient had right-sided diverticulitis. And I've already told you, you know, it looks something very, very similar to the epiploic appendagitis, except that in the rest of the scan, there will be full blown diverticular disease to give you a clue. This patient uh, on the right hand side, you can see a targetoid appearance of a bowel here, very thick and very low sort of, uh, of echogenicity and ultrasound. Again, it looks more tubular on this longitudinal slide. When you do a CT, you see involvement of the ileocecal valve and the terminal ileum there. This is contrast in the cecum. And this patient has actually had inflammatory bowel disease, so IBD Crohn's disease. And Crohn's patients with Crohn's can also present with right side to lower abdominal pain, can mimic appendicitis, or, you know, I mean, uh, sort of if they have collections or if they have a stricture and perforation of fistulae, the presentation can be similar to app appendicitis. Uh, uh, obviously, if they've not been diagnosed previously. So that's also to think uh, something to think about. This next slide again on the left hand side, it's uh, the ultrasound. And if you can see it's been labeled there as a uterus and. Just to the right of the uterus, you can see a large ovary, which looks very heterogeneous. And we did the CT here, this patient, and you can see the uterus again, the margins are very, very ill defined. There is some fluid in the caldi sac between the uterus and the rectum, which is uh, this bit around here where the cursor is. And you can see the enlarged ovary on the uh, putting the left pelvic side wall. And these patients with PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, can also come with lower abdominal pain. Sometimes the pain can be very excruciating. And you do the imaging and you find these findings. 
obviously you need to exclude other causes, uh, other pathologies when you do the ultrasound or CT, but this is a typical appearance of what you would expect to see in PID. And this case here, uh, the plain CT patient presented with hematuria, right renal pain, and this is a stone which is in the right mid ureter with the arrowheadus. And uh, you did the ultrasound. Ultrasound showed this is the kidney. There is hydronephrosis in the kidney. This is the dilated ureter. And that was the stone that was seen in the lower ureter. So that's a stone. You can see it appears very echogenic and there's shadowing distal to it. So this patient had a stone which was causing obstructive uropathy and hence leading to sort of pain uh, on the right side. So uh, moving on from there, uh, this patient, this is an ultrasound uh, of the uh, anterior abdominal wall. This is a normal looking rectus muscle on the left hand side, whereas on the right hand side, you see this fairly discrete area there in the right rectus abdominis muscle. This patient was on anticoagulants and had a sort of an injury or fall. And they did this and raised the possibility of uh, rectus sheet hematoma, subsequently mm -hmm. had CT, and the CT scan has shown the bright. So if you look, compare the left rectus abdominis muscle, the right is bulkier, and in the middle, you see this hyperdense area, which is a hematoma. So this is a rectus sheath hematoma, and these patients can also present with acute uh, sort of uh, lower abdominal pain, depending on wherever the hematoma is. So then... Um, one of the other entities which you can sort of encounter and you can kind of clinically examine these patients. This is a CT scan of the lower pelvis, approximately going through, uh, and it shows a very large hernia in the left groin. You can see the bowel loop. This loop has got a U-shaped configuration. It's all thickened. You see the stranding, which is going on in the mesentery, which and there is engorgement of mesenteric vessels. There's a bit of fluid around there as well. And all these signs are typical for a strangulated hernia in the groin. So again, you know, I mean, patients can present with hernias. If you see these features, these are typical for a strangulated hernia. So U-shaped loop, thickened loop, stranding, uh, mesenteric engorgement, you know, they're all signs of strangulation. Uh, so that's something to consider as well in the differential diagnosis lower down. Now, uh, this case, you may have seen it previously. Any, uh, I just need a volunteer to give a diagnosis on this one. I'm sure you must have seen this previously. So just to give you an idea, this is an exercise. Yeah, exercise. Uh, uh, taken to the level of lower pole of right kidney. Patient is presented with acute abdomen. It's a dissecting AAA. Yes, so, so you can see, that's excellent. So you can see the aorta here. That's the contrast in the lumen, right? You can see a mural thrombus there, right? But what is rather more important is this, the left side of the wall is not clearly seen and you see all this gray stuff, this is all hemorrhage. So this is a leaking AAA. That's high density material. If you take the Hounsfield unit, it will come somewhere between 60 to 70 Hounsfield unit, which is typical for blood. So that's an that's just, just an example of a leaking AAA. Uh, uh, and obviously this is, as you all know, it's a surgical sort of an emergency. So next one. I think probably this is going to be the last couple of slices. And like I said to you earlier on, I can't show you everything in this session, but it's the idea is just to show you maximum sort of pathology. So it give you an idea of how they appear on imaging. And this patient presented with the uh, uh, increased uh, lactase, lactate levels, and uh, acute sort of a presentation, tummy ache, abdominal distension, and a CT was requested. And what you see on this, is the small bowel loops, uh, which are dilated. There is some fluid in the mesentery. There's not a great deal of enhancement of the bowel wall there, but this structure with the arrowhead is, is this is the superior mesenteric vein. That's the superior mesenteric artery there. This is the portal vein. And remember that vascular structures, when you give contrast, should enhance, like the SMA here should be enhancing, whereas this structure here, it's completely non-enhancing. And that was a very large thrombus sitting in the 
superior mesenteric vein with some thrombus in the portal vein as well. So this was a case of mesenteric uh, uh, sort of ischemia, secondary to SMV thrombosis. So in summary, I'm going to end it here uh, by saying that imaging is actually widely applied in patients with acute abdomen. Relevant clinical information and imaging should is very important and it normally in, tends to increase the diagnostic accuracy and influence the patient management. The idea should be actually an approach should be to minimize radiation dose by you know, triaging the patient in such a way that you are using the right imaging modality, whereas in young patients tend to use more ultrasound uh, or maybe MRI if possible, and if not, then to go for CT. Use a location-based approach with ultrasound uh, in the right upper quadrant pain for, to rule out cholecystitis or bilirubinic, or a combination of ultrasound or CT in the rest of the quadrants. Uh, and uh, uh, consider using MRI you know, in pediatric patients, in pregnant patients, and can be used as a problem solving tool. And with that, thank you so much. If there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. Can I, can I ask you a question, please? Yes. Yeah, so for plain fluid abdomen, we are uh, suspecting obstruction. Should we go ahead with a plain X-ray or should we directly order CT scan? Okay, so oh, when you I... when you talk about the obstruction, you're talking about intestinal obstruction. Yep. Okay, so like I'd shown you the case, um, the, the, the the I think probably the fifth slide on the screen where I showed you an X-ray and then on a CT. Again, I told you that X-rays are basically non-specific. They can be non-specific, not all the time. Right. So you do the X-ray and you may be able to see the findings. You do the X-ray sometimes and you may not be able to see the finding. The other thing is also to answer your question is that if you do an X-ray and if you see a dilated loop, right, you're probably going to refer them to surgeons and then the surgeons are going to ask for a CT. So my approach to that would be that if you are suspecting intestinal obstruction based on clinical grounds, right, then your best bet would is going to be CT because you're going to save time. You can tend to see the diagnosis and it also helps the surgeon. Uh, it gives them a roadmap to decide where what is uh, what's the cause of obstruction, where the obstruction is. It will help them to plan their approach. So my answer to that would be go for CT. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? No, thank you. We're good. All right, that's good. Uh, if I just ask Dr.